prayer finish. For today's agenda, we will have opening and speaker introduction, lecturing session, post test session, and the last is closing and photo session. In this lecture, we will mainly discuss about drilling spec of oil and gas industry. But before we begin, I would like to inform you that there are rules that must be obeyed in this lecture. All webinar participants are expected to turn off the microphone function during the webinar to avoid sound leakage while the speaker is giving his presentation. Participants should turn on the camera so webinars can run interactively. Please introduce yourself before answering or asking a question. This lecture series uses the Slido platform for Q&A session, so before we start the lecture, participants can click or tap the link that we have already given to you via email to open the Slido website. Participants can ask questions during the presentation through the provided Slido question box, starting with the name, major, and batch. Also be aware, this course will give an award for the best student, which is determined from the assessment of activeness, post-test result, and attendance. By completing this course, you will receive a certificate of accomplishment and get the chance to join competition with being funded from us. Today, we're pleased to welcome Mr. Fikri Irawan as our drilling lecturer. Mr. Fikri is a technical advisor at Weatherford, and today he will be sharing with us his knowledge and expert opinion about the drilling process of oil and gas industry. With that, I ask that you give your full attention and let's get started. For Mr. Fikri Irawan, please start the lecture series. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy to be here uh, to be part of the SP first event. So uh, my name is Fikri. For those who, who doesn't know me, I'm with Weatherford right now. I've been with Weatherford in the past 10 years. So today I was given the honor to deliver the course of a uh, drilling, basic drilling, practice, and engineering. So I will start the sharing the slide. Please let me know when you can see it. Uh, share screen. screen one. And you confirm that you can see this. Anyone confirm that uh, you can see the screen that I'm sharing right now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, today, uh, let me hide all of you guys. Okay. Today, I'm uh, I will deliver the a short course about basic drilling practice and operation. So, as a preliminaries. Uh, what is a drilling operation? Drilling operation is a process to create a path which connects the surface and subsurface uh, environment. So basically, we create a hole into the well as per the, uh, the term itself. The objectives are to extract the natural resources. That's one of the uh, aim in uh, oil and gas industry for the injection of a fluid from surface to subsurface reservoir. So at some point, there, there are cases where we want to, uh, to throw away some uh, unused or pollutant that we have produced during drilling operation back into the formation itself, whether it's for uh, safety or even to increase the production of a well, which is uh, part of the uh, enhanced oil recovery uh, segment later on. And then the other objective for drilling is to uh, subsurface formation evaluation or monitoring. So in order to develop a well, uh, a, an oil field or gas field, uh, we need to perform uh, continuous improvement, continuous data gathering, and one of them is to do a uh, drilling operation uh, by getting some more information to develop and grow further. So that's the other objectives of drilling operation. So before we go further to uh, drilling itself, so there are 
I think I'd like to deliver a little bit about drilling. Uh, I mean, the entity that is involved in a drilling operations. So just so that we are all on, uh, understand on the same page later on. So the first is about drilling operators. So what is drilling operators? They are the oil and gas, the oil and or gas company that is, has successfully tendered for a field and owns the mineral rights of a blocks, lease and permits to explore in a particular area. They are responsible to plan the life of the well and specify the material and labor needed to develop this well or develop this field. Uh, they are responsible to order the necessary materials and equipment and personnel and recruit contractors to grow this field and produce the hydrocarbon. They are also the, the drilling operator is ultimately the, the entity that is responsible for the project. They win the contract of the tender of the blocks and they deal with the government and all uh, other official bodies that is required to uh, operate in this well, in this field. They can be either a national oil company or an international oil company, uh, whether it's government or a private sector. So these are some entities that I believe you are familiar, uh, that is commonly known as a drilling operator. First is uh, Pertamina, we got ExxonMobil, Chevron, uh, we used to have Total, in Indonesia, Stat Oil as well, Sino, Shell, Medco, or local crowd, and uh, Petronas, ConocoPhillips, and so on. So these are the samples of drilling operators. The second entity that is involved in drilling operation is we call them as a drilling contractors or a rig contractors. The drilling contractors responsible to supply the rig, and they can be a single company that own the rig or a small group of companies that are pooling resources to, uh, to do the drilling operation. Supplying the rig and crew are their responsible. And sometimes it is completed with consultants or specialists in a case by case, for example, uh, in an ultra drip water operation, HPHD operation, uh, extended rich wells or horizontal wells. So, some special criteria where extra care is required in the operation. So they are responsible to provide this. Basically, drilling contractor is the same to uh, rig contractors or the rig owners. These are some uh, of the from, uh, famous uh, drilling contractors in the, in the region. Uh, Valaris used to be Noble and Ensco. Uh, we also have Sea Drill. There's also Shelf Drilling, Sapura Energy, Coastal, Transocean, and MERS as well. And last but not least is the service company. Who is the service company? They are the people or entities that fills in the supply gaps for the contractors, between the contractors and the operators, uh, including but not limited to physical products, services, logistical, uh, supply chain, software, and training as well. They get called out to the rig uh, on a time to time to perform specific duties as agreed by the contractor, the drilling operator. There are also uh, many parts of drilling and completion operation, but the contractors or the operators, they have the, uh, the audacity or the uh, exclusivity to call, out, to call out not all of them, so just part of them. So in, in well A, we may require uh, specific services. But in well B, that services might not be required, so they don't get called off or utilized in the second well. So uh, many of the roles of the service companies are only needed occasionally, as mentioned before, or are very specialized. For example, uh, drilling fluids, there's a specific company who works or focus on drilling fluids, uh, cementing services, wire line, uh, or mud logging service expertise, and uh, liner hanger, managed pressure drilling, underbalance drilling. So, a lot of uh, service companies that focus in specific area, but some service company, they can have uh, more than one uh, product line or business unit, as you call it. So like, for example, Halliburton, they have bad weight for mud special specialty. Halliburton also have uh, cementing services. Uh, they also have wire line, but they don't have mud logging. So mud logging, for example, some company that focus in mud logging are geo services, uh, Geolog International and uh, Xlog as well. So these companies, sometimes they provide the whole range of services required, but uh, other prefer to have focus only in one or two products or services. So that's about uh, service companies. 
To drill a well, for example, in this case, uh, in this schematic, you see, um, oh, yeah, you see that to drill a well, uh, the drilling operator will be responsible to provide the rig, mud, directional drilling, cementing, casing, wireline, all of the services that they think is required and to attain all the data correct. But however, it takes more than one entities to drill a well, so collaboration is a must and mandatory. So for those who doesn't understand that, uh, because I was under the impression by the time I was in college, I was under the impression that Chevron is the one who owned the rig, Chevron who provide the, the mud logging services, Chevron is the guy or the entity who provide their own, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, mud services. So it's all, it's all uh, on some uninformed people like me was before. So uh, it was not, it was incorrect. So the correct uh, term or thing is, there's always a separate uh, and a fixed line between drilling operator and a service company. The next chapter will be about the types of wells. So um, there's a wells that we call it wildcat or exploration well. Close to none information to about the subsurface. Uh, sometimes no data at all, where we call it a wildcat. And uh, in exploration well, you normally put a lot of risk over there. And uh, sometimes you put extra measures for safety. You put more cost for logistical because it's a remote area. And uh, in exploration wells, apologize for that one. Sorry, I forgot to turn out my WhatsApp. Okay, now it's, we're good. Apologies on that one, okay. So about exploration well, uh, Indonesia in 2020, we don't have a lot of exploration wells as it was in back in 2015, 2014, where uh, hundreds of exploration wells was approved by SKK Migas at that time. But do the downturn, uh, the second downturn that we have right now, the exploration does not uh, flourish, you can call it that way, and uh, very limited. Everybody is trying to save costs and minimize their capex to uh, and their expenses to their operation so that they can sustain the current downturn and uh, maybe they can keep the, their employee longer uh, by being more economic at the same time. The second types of wells are appraisal well. Uh, this is to determine the size of the field. So once you drill the exploration well, you go drill uh, two, three more wells, four more wells, depends on uh, how, how fast the, wheel, the field you, you assume. And uh, by drilling appraisal wells, you can understand that whether your, uh, your blocks are economic or not, are good enough or not, are sustainable enough or not, does it contain good pressure that is economic for another 20 years? Does it contain a massive volume of hydrocarbon that they can make the company grow and sustain for another 20, 30 years, especially in that uh, country? So appraisal well, wildcat or exploration, normally you only drill one or two. And then appraisal wells, it takes two, three, sometimes five, depends on how, how uh, wide is the area. And then the third type of wells is the development wells. Development wells uh, is once you do your exploration wells and then the appraisal wells most of the time, not always, but uh, most of the time after they do exploration, then the appraisal well, wells, then they can uh, start the development wells. Development wells is drilling a lot of wells that, that require uh, immense effort to uh, do the calculation, to prepare all the program, all the cost, all the budget, where the money came from, will SKK Migas or regulator approves this? And uh, another important thing is, is it going to be economic to be developed? Because uh, you drill three wells, it seems, uh, you drill one well, it seems economic, and then when you drill uh, five wells in total, including the appraisals, and then it turns out it's not. 
it's only a small block, small basins that uh, does not sustain for another five years. Probably. So they don't proceed to the development and then they stop over there. But once the SKM guys review and agree with the plans, they will challenge uh, the drilling engineers and most of the time it's the, the reservoir engineers who, who creates the plan for the uh, oil development, oil field development. So once this is challenged to the drilling operators and challenge accepted, and they can proceed and get approval and start the uh, development phase of that particular blocks. Infill drilling, it is, uh, it is what do you call it? Drilling between existing wells to increase production. So basically you have a, a set of uh, pre-drilled development wells already in, in, the, in that particular blocks. And then uh, you think that you can increase some more maybe by drilling at this particular spot in between well A and well B, where there might be a small lenses of unproduced uh, trap, and then you go with infill drilling. And then delineation well, it's, uh, it's kind of a, not, necessar necessar not necessarily exploration, but you, once you found the border of the field and then you try to find and push further, of course, after the blessing from the GNG and subsurface team saying that, guys, I think uh, there's a chance that we can drill further toward the east direction and try to find something better at there, at that area and uh, see if we can uh, enlarge our reserves by drilling some more and getting some more data. So that's what they call delineation well. The other one that is quite common is re-entry wells. Re-entry wells is, as per the term, is uh, when you have a well that is existing and then you do the uh, re-entry to deepening or sidetrack or whatever that you need to do, to, to do over there to, uh, to increase the net pay maybe maybe to clean and to reduce the uh, formation damage by uh, acidizing. And then before you acid, you do deepening because you were sure that there was some settlement at the bottom, this and that. Basically, a lot of green stuff, but needs to be approved by the workover and uh, the uh, drilling services team most of the time. So that's the types of the well. There, there are six main types. I think I believe there are some more to this, but because it's not famous, I don't put it here. Next will be about the well construction. So a typical well casing diagram uh, is like this. You have a uh, annulus C, annulus B, annulus A, and a tubing section. So uh, this section are mainly uh, the divided by the case or casing you call it. It's a big pipe uh, that is we, we installed in the well so that we can prevent and we can stabilize the well, keep contaminants and water out of the oil system. Also prevent from, uh, from prevent oil from leaching into the groundwater. Casing is installed in layers. So uh, in sections of decreasing diameters that are joined together to form casing strings. So for example, uh, you drill a uh, 24 uh, inch uh, hole section, and then you install a 20 inch uh, casing size. And then you run in a hole, your BHA 17 and a half. And then once you reach target depth, you install the casing uh, 13 and 3 eighths or 10 and 5, 4, 10 and uh, 5, 8. And then you drill 12 and a quarter hole section, you install the casing in 5, 8 over there. You drill in half, install a liner or casing 7 inch. So this goes on and on. So it depends on how the drilling engineers, if you're interested to be a drilling engineer, and uh, you will need to plan this ahead. And if there is, if you're in an exploration well, sometimes you, you have to prepare a, a contingency section. So for example, uh, you want to drill with, uh, you want to drill with four, normally you drill with four, 
for a uh, type of casing, maybe 20 and then 13 and then nine and then uh, seven and so forth. But at this point you might uh, prepare as a backup just in case you don't reach target depth because it's an exploration well, so you don't know what's gonna happen. And uh, uh, you prepare a contingency basically. So if you don't reach target uh, the uh, 12 and a quarter, uh, the first thing that you're gonna set is the uh, 10 and 5.8. And then you drill a little bit smaller than the 1058, and you set up the uh, 958 as possible. Depends on whatever you have and what have you planned. And uh, there are some, as mentioned before, there are several types of casing casings. Uh, first is conductor casings. This is the most, uh, the outest casing and the shallowest casing that uh, we have in the rig site. Normally, it's only a couple of uh, feet. Uh, down there from the surface. Surface casing, sometimes it's up to, and then smaller than that, intermediate casing. So this is more focused on the, uh, on the uh, tackling the subsurface issues for like, for example, uh, well bore collapse, prevent any, uh, to, to set up or to mark your uh, fracturing point, sorry. Fracture, uh, fracture gradient point. Because once you set the casing, then that end of the point is the safest point that you have. The set, the, the, the target, the, the TD of the casing is the safest point of your uh, fracture point. And then production casing. Production casing is the, the smallest casing that you have in the well, uh, mostly as, as per the term. Production casing is used for producing the hydrocarbon. So um, in South Sumatra, they have a big core seven inch by nine and five eight production casing. And uh, in most of the operation, they have four and a half, uh, three and a half size of casing or tubing. So there are four types of uh, casing, uh, casing that I propose here or I mentioned here. So conductor, surface casing, intermediate and production casings. In between, you might have surface casing one, surface casing two, or intermediate casing one, intermediate casing two, depends on the contingencies that you have prepared during the uh, engineering design. And then move on to the types of the directional wells. So the wells, there are vertical wells, the, there's also a uh, direction wells. In vertical wells, uh, you drill straight nearly a couple of degrees, maybe one, two, three degrees is still acceptable uh, of inclination. But in directional wells, you have the special design uh, of the well uh, trajectory and azimuth and inclination. So uh, there's a special service company that do this. Uh, Slumberjay have this, they call it Anadrill. They uh, Halliburton, they call it Sperry. Weatherford, they have uh, precision their drilling services. Baker, they have uh, direction as well. Local companies such as Parama, we also have a, there's also a directional services uh, locally. And uh, the purpose of directional services is to create a well that is not vertical, intentionally, intentionally. So uh, in, in this course, uh, I will discuss four types of common um, shape or uh, diagram of a directional well. The first is build and hold. So, sorry, this is build and hold. Apologize on that one. Why does it switch? Right. right. Okay, the first uh, schematic is the build, hold, and drop. So this is what they call it build. The, the first green section, first green section is build section, where we start to directional by kicking off from the vertical point. And then we stay vertical, sorry, stay, stay in tangent section, and then start dropping off until we reach the target depth or phase one that we want. So the first type of, Still at the JNA still. Still, still feed JNA. 
So the first type uh, is build, hold, and drop. Uh, it doesn't have, doesn't always have to be like this. Uh, the drop can be only slight drop and then meet the pay zone immediately. Sometimes it goes back to vertical and before it touches the pay zone. So it depends on the discussion between well planner, uh, subsurface team, and the drilling engineer. And then the second type is build and hold. Build and hold section is uh, the first you do vertical and then kick off, start uh, deviating the well, and then go straight until you reach the pay zone where you end and uh, touch the pay zone with the tangent section. So this is the build and hold type. The third is the J shape. J shape is, as per the term, it's a J type of well. So uh, vertical, and then you build, and then finish the well at that point. However, if you drill further uh, horizontally toward the uh, lateral section, then you will end up making a horizontal well, or sometimes they call it extended bridge well. So these are the four types of directional wells. So with the vertical, total is five. So one vertical and four types of uh, directional services. Okay, so is there any question about this one? About the first two chapter of this course? No? Maybe, uh, so we'll move on to the fun quiz then. So who can answer this? What is the casing type that is used after the well reaches target depth and ready for production? Anyone? If anyone want to answer, just unmute and answer the questions. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea because if you are mute, then you cannot hear it. All right, sorry. Right. Yeah, of course. Go ahead, sir. Please introduce yourself, mention your name, and then you can go straight with the answer. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Rayvan. I'm from Pertamina University. And the answer is production casing. Yeah. All right. You're good. The answer is correct. So, uh, so I'll move on, only one question. Next will be the rig, about the rig system. So from, for those who have petroleum engineering uh, major, I think most of you guys have uh, got this course before, but uh, if, you have any, if you have any question or concern, just let me know, uh, and then uh, I'll try to answer my best. Drilling rig. Drilling rig, drilling rig is a device that is used to drill case and pump cement and complete the operation of the drilling operation. Based on the environment, uh, we have onshore or land rigs, offshore rigs. Uh, it, it covers the floating and uh, bottom support on the offshore. As for the uh, floating or the floater, there's a type of drill ships, there's a type of semi-submersible, there's also a dynamic position, semi-submersible and a fixed or anchored uh, semi-submersible. As for the bottom support, we have a jack-up rig, platform, uh, gravity base, and some, some more, basically. So this is the type or sample of a land rig. I think we have a, a lot of land rig operation in here in Indonesia. We have Pertamina AP, most of them are land rig. Medco, also land rig and uh, some Chevron, Exxon, Landrick in Indonesia. So these are the magnitude of a Landrick operation. Depends on how smart you plan the well and the well pad can require massive area and uh, also can be minimized as small as possible as long as you can deal with the society and the local uh, government. And for the floating rigs, 
we got the first one is uh, this is a drill ship and then this is the, the other two is a semi submersible so the semi submersible is is used these two basically drill ships and semi submersible most of them are used or operated to drill a, a deep water medium to deep water operation and some even a ultra deep water operation in a shallower area where you can step on the foot of the uh, drilling rigs, uh, you can utilize the bottom support rigs. Uh, the first thing, this is gravity based, this is a gravity based. So basically, this two, they have a massive, uh, uh, what do you call it, a massive leg, long, very, very long legs that can step into the bottom of the seafloor, then they can start the drilling operation. And uh, this is a jackup type of rig. The jackup rig is a, they can lift the, their legs up to a certain position and then they can be towed and mobilized from one platform or one drilling area to another. And basically, uh, as well as a gravity base, they can move. So if I remember correctly, gravity base, there's a, a big, what do you call it, a uh, chamber at the bottom of this concrete. So inside of the concrete, there's a big chambers where you can fill out with uh, water or uh, air. So that if you feel a lot of air, then it starts to float, then you can start towing this rig uh, into the desired position. Uh, the same principle with backup, the, but just a different method. For jackup, you lift all the trees, three legs. Sometimes you got, most of them have three legs for the jackups, yes. And uh, you lift these legs off from the rig floor, then tow to the next position or next location where you want to drill. And then once you reach that position, whether it's a open water or a platform, in, in this case, uh, the jackup will drill in the platform. You can see there's a platform over here. Then it will start the operation by extending the cantilever deck. But if it is in the open water, there's no platform. There's a special deck that uh, exists or present on the bottom of the rig here, around here, on the bottom of the hole. They call it a uh, BOP deck or something. I can't remember. Texas deck. They call it the Texas deck. So the deck is used to uh, set some light equipment over there, but basically everything is supported by the, uh, the mud line suspension by the, by the seabed. Okay, so based on the water depth, um, 150 meters, you can use a platform or jack up. It is rarely that we have jackup that can uh, drill up to 150 meters water depth. Uh, most of the one that we have in Asia or Indonesia up to 110, 112, and 20 meters. But some special jackup, they can ex the the leg can be extended that they can reach up to 150 meters. For semi sub anchored and drill ship. Uh, without dynamic position, they can drill with the water depth up to one, one and a half kilometers from the surface of the water. And uh, semi sub and drill ship, they can drill uh, the deep water operation 3,000 meters or more because they don't need to step anything to the bottom of the sea. And uh, okay, so this is also, this is not a rig. This is not a drilling rig, but I think I feel I have the responsibility to, to address this to you guys. So platform, fixed platform, uh, they are a means to support the well heads and the conductors on the surface. But in the end, when you drill, it's always another rig coming from outside, such as Jacob or tender assist rig or a drill ship. Not drill ship platform, mostly a uh, jackup and tender assist or barge. So the another rig comes, they bring all the service company on board, and then they come to each of these platform, depends on uh, which operation that they, they're going to operate. So for example, 
uh, a jackup, they will operate in fixed platform. So they, they will tow the jackup body here and then start connecting to the platform and then set up the BOP and then start drilling. But uh, in a deeper condition, maybe a, uh, a, an anchored type, there's a, it's rarely they, they, in, in the semi sub, they don't have any plat platform. But basically, once the rig is finished and the wellhead are completed, then they, they will have to choose whether they want to have a surface uh, production facility or subsurface production facility. If they want to have a surface production facility, then they, they will have to choose for a medium or deeper water. They would have to choose one of these uh, type of uh, platform, depends on the condition of the area, depends on the depth, the depth of the water, and uh, also the, the cost, of course, whether it's economic or not. Moving on, so in Asia, this is a little bit trivia, uh, in Asia right now, as per July 2020, we have these rigs operating. So this is, you can call it quite small volume. So there's only six uh, semi-submersible rig operating in Asia. It means it covers, it covers uh, the whole Asia operation, Myanmar, Thailand, Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, so the whole Asia, there's only six uh, floater semi-submersible and drill ship operating as per today. And uh, I see, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Twelve jackup operating, yeah, operating. So there are six and twelve uh, offshore operation right now running in Asia concurrently. And uh, this is a quite small amount considering Asia have a, a lot of uh, active oil and gas companies and they need to sustain their uh, volume of uh, contractual needs to supply whether it's gas or oil. However, in Indonesia, as per today, we have seven jackup bricks and one tender assist brick. So eight, it's considered eight. So out of the 12 jackups, all of them are uh, seven of them are in Indonesia. So you can call half of the rig right now actively operating in Indonesia on the offshore, so to say. However, there are a lot of other rigs that is in not in a good condition. Maybe the contract runs out and the warm stack rig, we have 19 jackups, four drill ships in Asia right now under construction. Yes, they do still produce or fabricate rigs. Maybe it's uh, to fulfill the commitment that they have uh, agreed before the pandemic and the downturn of the second downturn in 2020. And uh, eight jackups in the cold stack and around eight jackups in the scrap in the past nine years. So here, these are all the statistics statistic that I got from uh, Ristat energy and uh, from this you can see that a lot of uh, rig is not operating right now and uh, it's a very sad in, uh, condition for the industry but we, sh we still have some more operation running in Indonesia uh, for offshore this calculation is only for offshore because onshore is very difficult to keep track on but we have a lot of onshore operation right now, especially with our friend in Pertamina EP and uh, Medco, not so much, but we also have uh, Pertamina, even uh, PHE, oh sorry, Saka, Saka Energy, even they have a upcoming land rig operation. Previously they were in offshore Java, uh, offshore Java, West Java. Okay, so that's the rig activity in Asia right now as per today. Okay, any question until that point? Question one, number two, and okay, go. The next chapter will be about the components and mechanism of the rig system or drilling system. I believe most of you have known this, but there are five types of the uh, rig components system. First is power system. And then hoisting system, circulating system, rotary system, and well control system. 
someone is unmuting okay is there anyone to ask any question no okay okay power system uh, the purpose of the power system is to generate the electrical power uh, that is used to operate all the grid and the service company system most of the time it's diesel powered uh, internal combustion engines sometimes they do bring uh, electrical uh, stuff as well but most of the time it's diesel powered so this diesel and uh, power generator it will uh, it will uh, create and supply power to the prime mover to create electricity or to create mechanical force to operate the rigs and uh, basically it's a power source it's a power power system uh, generated by the generator a hoisting system it is a large pulley system which is used to lower and raise the uh, equipment into and out of the well sometimes they also used it to lift some very heavy equipment at the site but rarely the components of hoisting system consists of uh, draw works. There's also fast line, dead line, crown block, traveling blocks, hooks and elevators. So draw works here. Uh, this is the primary source of the uh, rotational so that all of the fast line will be pulled in or stretched out back in order to move the traveling blocks through the crown block uh to you know to reduce the uh the force required it's physics okay so uh for fast line this is the line that will move uh stretching in or stretching out to in order to uh, reduce or increase the length of operable line in the derrick in the mast and then traveling blocks this is the intentional or the objectives of the system it needs to move the traveling blocks up or down but in order to do that the fast line needs to be lured in or lured out from the drawers or by the drawers at the end of the fast line there's what we call it deadline the deadline is anchored at some point at the rig side mostly most of the time at the corner of the, the rig floor so uh, you you want to have this dead all the time fix all the time you don't want this to move because if this move it means that the traveling block is at loose condition and it may fall and uh, drop into somebody so that's about the hoisting system uh, you got draw works fast line deadline crown blocks traveling blocks hooks and elevator and then the circulating system uh, it is its function is to circulate drilling fluid down through the drill string and up to the annulus also to carry all the drill cuttings from the face from the surf, from the face of the bit to the surface so uh, the components are mixing hoppers mud pits mud pumps suction pit stand pipe kelly hose drill pipe or drill string a uh, bit and when it returns back to the analyst and back to the surface it goes to the mud conditioning system which is consists of shell shaker the sender the filter the gasser whichever applicable that can be used so in the flow here uh it's from the suction pit or the mud tank and then sometimes they got they got specific mud tank to collect and then transfer to the suction pit so that they know what is the requirement, uh, the exact volume. And then once it's in the suction pit, it will goes up into the mud pump and then pump into the standpipe. Uh, the standpipe picture is here a little bit minimalist, but in actual standpipe is like a, a network of piping where you can have, uh, when you can change from standpipe one, standpipe two, or the other way around and a lot of valves uh, involved in there but basically the purpose of the standpipe is to connect the fluid from the mud pump to the kelly hose the next part will be about the kelly hose kelly hose is the start from the end of the standpipe apologize 
at the end of the standpipe until it reaches the swivel. So the Kelly hose is a high pressure hose, flexible enough because uh, the Kelly hose will experience uh, stretching in and stretching out as the swivel uh, move up and down, and that is that will be moved by the hoisting system, which is the traveling blocks. And then from the swivel, uh, the mud will go into the whether it's a Kelly. If not, then it goes straight to the drill pipe. Then it might go to the drill collars and all the VHA bottom hole, bottom hole assembly, and then it will be. Uh, discharge at the end of the bit uh, through the bit nozzles and it will create a high pressure into the downhole which uh, which hopefully it is the uh, cutting dismantle by the bit and then the mud and the cuttings will move and travel through the analyst to the surface back, back to the shell shaker to be conditioned by the mud conditioning system. If there is any gas or any sand, if there's any sand uh, cont containment during the drilling in the cuttings, and then they will operate and divert to the descender. And then if there is silt needs to be cleaned out from the mud as a contaminant, they pass it through the silter to clean out the silt. And if there's any uh, dangerous gas, they pass it to the gas, the degasser. So that's about circulating system. Uh, the rotary system or rotating system, the function of this system is to rotate the drill string and therefore the drill bit on the bottom of the borehole. And uh, oh my guys, got it. Okay, right. And then it moves uh, the rotary. The rotating system moves the drill string. Basically, gives the rotational force to the whole string, to the whole pipe, to the bit. So uh, the hoisting system provide the vertical force up and down, but the rotating system will create the rotational to the drill string that we, uh, that we uh, lift by the ho hoisting system. The components of the rotating system are top drive, rotary Kelly bushing, rotary table, Kelly and swivel. If you are in a uh, recent operation of the drilling, uh, it's you, you rarely find a rig which utilize a Kelly anymore because most of them are used, using top drive right now. Uh, it creates efficiency, flexibility, and improves the operation, especially the uh, pipe connection operation. So it saves a lot of time by uh, utilizing the top drive and removing the Kelly system. So basically the rotating system, uh, all about the rotating system, you got the top drive, rotary Kelly bushing, rotary table, Kelly and swivel. And then the last but not least system is the well control system. This is one of the most important system uh, in the drilling operation. Well control system, it, it prevents the uncontrolled flow of formation fluids from the well bore to surface. So it's a safety measure. The components are a diverter, annular preventer, ram preventer, blind or shear rams, uh, choke manifold, hydraulic control remote valves, and choke and key lines accumulators. So the diverter, uh, it is a low pressure containment device that is used to divert a fluid in a shallow gas operation. So when you drill a shallow gas, you don't have time to uh, perform the well control. What you can do is uh, route it to the diverter, shut in the diverter and prevent the gas uh, pass through the rotary table and then it's diverted to the, uh, at the end of the diverter line. You can burn it as well. And the uh, second is annular preventer. Annular preventer, most of the time, it has a higher pressure rating, sometimes 2,000 PSI, sometimes 5,000 PSI. Most of the time, it's 5,000 PSI. And uh, most of the time, it's 2,000 PSI, sorry. The RAM preventers, it's a pipe RAM, also commonly known as a pipe RAM. Uh, it has a lot of variations, but a little bit different 
with annular and fibram. Uh, annular preventer, it has the capability to stretch in and stretch out a little bit when the drill pipe pass through it, if it is required. But pipe ram or ram preventer doesn't have the exclusivity because pipe ram is a fixed size. So once you have a drill pipe, okay, I want to drill the whole section with a drill pipe five inch. So before you start running hold the VHA, the uh, pipe ram uh, face need to be set or replaced into the five inch type. If you drill with uh, with a uh, four inch or four and a half inch, then you need to adjust and remove the five inch piece and then install the four and a half inch. So this is the kind of preparation that we need to do and aware, be aware. Blind and shear ram. So the diverter, annular preventer, and ram preventer, they have the capability to hold the drill pipe and prevent the annulus fluid uh, migrating or traveling to the surface. However, the uh, blind or shear ram, this uh, completely shut down the well and cut anything uh, that passed through it. So it will cut, if it's drill pipe, it will cut the drill pipe. If it is a drill collar, it will cut the drill collar, yes. And then number five is choke manifold. Choke manifold is, uh, it is a system that is used to increase back pressure on the surface so that if you increase back pressure it will increase the bottom hole pressure of the annular system and uh, at some point it will be utilized for a well control operation later and uh, hr valves this is hydraulic control remote valves these valves are required to manipulate the surface pipeline the surface flow uh, during a well control and also to increase the efficiency as well, because uh, if you are under high pressure on the surface pipeline, it is less, uh, it is more safety if we use a hydraulic controlled remote valve rather than the manual gate valves. And then number seven is choke or kill lines. The line is used for uh, connecting between the wellhead and the rig choke or to if it's a kill line to connect between the standpipe into the wellhead because choke line is for the return and kill line is for the inlet both of them are into the annulus and number eight is the accumulator accumulator is part of the well control system because the accumulator will provide uh, hydraulic power to activate uh, the piston in apologize to activate the piston in diverter or annular preventer or pipe ramps or blind and shear ramps so that it can shut in through the annulus. So everything is uh, remotely operated by the accumulator. Whoop, sorry. Any question about that one? There is uh, actually have a questions. Yes, go ahead. The first one is, um, uh, our dual ram rig has commercially used in a lot of offshore oil rig operation. Dual ram? Has commercially used in a lot of offshore oil rig operation. Oh yeah. Are you talking about which uh, which pipe ram? Uh, I think for for the uh, for F one, you can unmute and get the conversation with Mr. Pikri. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Pikri, for the explanation before. Um, I just want to uh, have a have a curious. I just curious about uh. How commercially used is the dual ram rig? Because uh, as before, I've been joining a an oil rig design competition, and um, I'm uh, in charge of calculating the economical. But uh, I see that the dual ram rig is over uh, is pro is offer uh, an efficient system to um, bring a well because it use. Uh, dual system, use dual top drive, 
and it make the... oh double tower yes okay that's it okay okay i understand dual ram and double tower. okay okay you call it uh, from what what you said in my understanding it's called double tower okay go ahead so you want to know about dual tower rig yes okay uh, yeah so I... yeah go ahead go ahead okay. continue your question when i'm calculated the economy uh, i see that the dual tower is much higher and expensive than the single tower and uh, i'm just curious about uh is it commercially used because uh, it's over a great advantage of ring operations? Okay, yes. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, dual tower uh, rig do exist and are commercial commercially used in the in the world right now. They though I would not say I know precisely the quantity, but uh, dual tower rig mostly. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Pre-equipped in a offshore deep water operation. For example, floater. Most of the time, a drill ship. Most of the time, most of the time, a drill ship. And uh, I, I rarely see a. No, I think I think the Edsco Ed five O four. They have double tower. So dual tower rig. They have two mast, two derricks, two top drag, two two everything. Yes. Okay. So uh, back in the day where where uh, where the oil price was 128, 130 dollars a barrel, and uh, the operation was back in 2013, 2014, 2015 still. Okay, so at that point, all the rig price daily rate are very very expensive. So for example, a drill ship in Indonesia. Uh, one of the drill ship operates in Indonesia back in 2013, 2012 is the uh, Transocean. I forgot the name. Transocean. Mm -hmm. rig, yeah. But basically, the daily rate of the rig itself nearly one million dollars a day. Okay, one million dollars a day uh, online time that uh, whoever used that rig needs to be paid to the uh with the drilling contractor okay so one million dollars a day that translate to okay how many per hour so one million divided by 24 so that's 41 million okay divided by 20. so that's 42,000 that the company have to expand every hour so to run uh, a deep water operation, for example, a marine riser, marine riser, to run it, it takes one and a half day. Depends how deep of the water depth. Mm. One and a half day, that translates as 1.5 million. Okay, in a dual tower, you can cut that by half. Because, not because it has to run everything uh dual by dual tower no but because i believe you are you understand about the dual tower as well so one tower will will uh will run online the other tower tower will pre-assemble things that would that can be run online later on so by cutting this hidden time yes maybe the rig needs to be paid at instead of forty two thousand the rig maybe will be at 50,000 per hour. So that's a difference of 8,000 per hour uh, that they save, uh, that they, they need to pay, right? However, they can save up to uh, 750,000 per day. So 8,000 per hour multiplied by 24, that's so many hours, so many millions, uh, so many hundred thousand, let's say 200,000. And then they spend 200,000, but they save 750. That's a way to look at it. I'm not sure whether it's still economic right now because uh, everybody have pulled off their price. Uh, a lot, not much operation, low demand. And everybody wants to uh, to keep their rig operating. So instead of charging one million a day, now they <coughs> charge the client at 
maybe 300,000 a day. So it's, it's also uh, adjusting to the market. But from my perspective, yes, it's still economic. It's doing, using a dual tower rig uh, compared to uh, what saves that they, that they make. So I think what you need to investigate in the future for your economic calculation is uh, make sure you know what actual operation is going to happen because you might skip one of the economic calculation where uh, a dual tower need to prepare this instead of uh, one, uh, instead of calculating one, you can calculate it by half or maybe 60% only. So just make sure you be more specific in the activity that you calculate in your economic calculation. I think, I think that that should translate to a better number later. It's not that your calculation is wrong. It's just that maybe, just maybe, uh, the actual activity where you can save money by paying some more is not there. I hope that answered to your question, Ivan. Yes, thank you, Mr. Fikri. And I think uh, the investment will be worth it uh, if the situation is uh, not just like uh, in this pandemic. And I think uh, from your explanation, it will cut a lot of non-productive time. So the uh, overall operation expenditure will be lower, but the yes. uh, capital expenditure will be higher, but uh, it will be much worth it if the situation of the oil and gas prices is also high. Yes. Thank you. So for example, there's a case recently, uh, I'm working in the weather port right now. So uh, uh, I also, um, my focus in, in managed pressure drilling, so one of the uh, revenue or the business stream that I work is capital sales. Capital sales meaning you sell big items to the, whether it's a drilling company, uh, sorry, drilling contractor or to operator. So for example, at, this, at the last, I think uh, end of 2019, one of the rig company, they call it Blue Well, it's a Chinese brand, Chinese flag. So it's a very big rig semi-submersible that they own. It's one of the biggest semi-submersible rig uh, that, they, uh, that exists in the world right now. But they're planning to buy uh, an MPD capital uh, worth of, I think, $10 million. Because the client who requests for rig uh, is making it mandatory for the rig to have a uh, MPD ready. So the client Santos at that point, Santos in Australia, they issue a tender for a floater or semi-submersible rig. And then the tender uh, makes the drilling contractor who wants to participate, they have to have uh, MPD system on board of the rig. So. And then the rig comes back to Santos. Okay, how many wells? Okay, we're going to drill 15 wells in three years from now. Okay, so now 15 wells will have to be invested or divested uh, into the 10 million capital sales where the blue well will have to purchase to Weatherford uh, capital, right? And then, so they will have to calculate everything. So 10 wells and uh, sorry, 15 wells, three years, they'll have to calculate all the depreciations, all the costs associated to maintain the capital later on, the next three years, and then translate that number into the price that they will submit to Santos later on. Yeah, Santos already understand that the price will be higher compared to the price without uh, MPD. But just like as your, uh, case, if Santos is asking for a dual tower rig, Santos are ready with a bigger expense and capital upfront because they cannot bid or they cannot get a single tower rig with the price. They cannot get the dual tower rig with the price of single tower. Yes, definitely. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Pikri, for the explanation. No problem, Ivan. Any more question? Maybe Mr. Fikri can continue the presentation. Okay, I'll carry on.
Next will be about drilling problems. Uh, several drilling problems, uh, common drilling problems in the uh, operations are, one of them is a stuck pipe. It is a term used to describe a situation in which the drill string cannot be moved up, down, or rotation. So the, there are four types of uh, stuck pipe. First is because of the differential sticking. Second is because of hole restriction. Third is because of the cavings. And uh, the fourth one is about hole irregularities or difference or incompatible BHA. And then another drilling problem is about loss circulation. Uh, loss circulation is a non-controlled flow of the whole mud into the formation. And then there's a hole deviation, unintentional departure of the drill bit from a pre-selected borehole trajectory. There's also drill pipe failures, twist off, parting, burst collapse, uh, borehole instability, the undesirable condition of a uh, well bore falling into the annulus system and might create a uh, stuck in the end, but it's because of the borehole instability. Mud contamination, changes in mud properties such as density, viscosity and filtration. And another problem is hole cleaning, also shallow gas zone. Hole cleaning means uh, Poor hole, poor hole cleaning. In the end, it will lead to pipe stuck, yes. So, but the root cause is because the hole cleaning was not good. Maybe the mud rheology uh, incompatible with the formation. Uh, also, maybe it's not too, it's, it's too light, not viscous enough to cut the, to, to bring the cutting to the surface. And maybe the gel strength is insufficient or whatever. And then the next one is shallow gas zone. So normally when you drill on the surface, you don't, you have a unpredicted uh, gas pocket. And then what you need to do is just divert to the diverter and then let it flow. The other drilling problem is the well kick. Uh, it's a well control problem in which the pressure found within the drilling, drilled rock is higher than the mud hydrostatic pressure or the butthole pressure acting on the borehole. So basically the kick, Kick happens because the formation pressure is higher than the bottom of pressure that you uh, prepare you know, when drilling. So there are five or six kick indications. Uh, the first is sudden increase in drilling rate, or you call it drilling break due to porous formation, potential pay interval. Uh, normally, when you find a drilling break, you stop drilling and pull the lift, uh, uh, lift the bit of bottom uh, as, as, fast, uh, as soon as possible. You don't want to penetrate through a porous uh, formation because the fluid in that formation might uh, migrate and travel into the well bore. Another indication is increase in fluid volume at the surface, uh, which translate to the increase in the pit levels. Change in the pump pressure. A decrease in pump pressure during influx is caused by reduced hydrostatic in the annulus. So uh, that's why when drilling, the driller also pay attention to the pump pressure. When what is the normal pump pressure that they have? And then frequently, maybe every 15 minutes, every half an hour, he needs to pay attention to that pump pressure all the time uh, for, I don't know, for five minutes straight to ensure that it is the correct numbers, no, no significant changes. Reduction in drill pipe weight. So when you drill, you have your hoisting system. In the hoisting system, there's a means to measure how heavy is the drill pipe right now in the well, or you call it a hook load. And then you have a drill pipe uh, with the length drill pipe and drill collars and all of the BHA with the length of 2,000 feet. And then up in the air without a hydrostatic column, the weight might be 1.5 pounds, million pounds. But when you put it into the hydrostatic column, it gets lighter. Maybe it only translates to 1.1 pound, million pounds. 
But in the end, you don't drill with 1.1 million. You don't fully uh, lay the drill pipe and the bit into the formation with 1.1 million uh, of weight. You put only maybe 500,000, maybe 400,000 pounds. You, so you, you hang it a little bit by the traveling blocks as you drill and then if you want to drill faster, you, gain, you give more weight by uh, releasing the, uh, the hoisting system a little bit. So that's it about traveling block. So, and then the last one, the key indications is uh, gas, oil, or water cut mud. This indicator is also normally accompanied by uh, one of the other four indicators above if the well is, if the well is experiencing influx or kick. So those are, I think five only, five. Those are the five indicators of kick. So moving on to well control. So once you have kick, what you need to do is to perform well control operation by using, by activating the well control system in the field. So what to do with the well control system? What you need to do first is to shut in. Shut in to close the annulus so that you have a closed, perfectly sealed analyst system without return to surface and everything is contained uh, at the bottom and no additional influx, hopefully no additional influx migrates from the formation into the wellboard. So that's the intention. So there are two types of shut-in. I know it's a bit too technical. There's a soft shut-in, also there's a hard shut-in. The difference is only because uh, the choke position. The choke position in the soft shut in is uh, in open position, hard shut in is in the closed position. And once you do the shut in, you, you need to do the uh, observation. So how long needs to be observed? As long as you need, sometimes it takes uh, two hours, sometimes it's only take 15 minutes. So depends on uh, the, the, the condition of the well. If it's a, Oil-based mud normally takes longer than that. If it's a water-based mud, normally it's uh, shorter than that one. Because if oil, yeah, if oil mud is being used, the observation needs to be lengthened because there's a potential uh, longer time for the system to get to its, its uh, equilibrium uh, state where the gas that is diluted inside the uh, oil-based mud uh, to be released before it's fully equilibrium. A typical shut-in procedure, drill no more than three feet or one meters of, uh, once you see the drilling break, pick off bottom and then flow check. If there is any flow observed, shut in the well again. Do not try to flow check further. Record the pit volume increase, drill pipe pressure, and the analyst pressure. Monitor the wells. And uh, in the monitoring the wells, you need to check the drill pipe pressure until it is equilibrium. It's rarely reached to straight line, but you, once you are in the oil field, you know the fields when you feel that it's already equilibrium or not. And then shut in the annular or, uh, and open the pipe ramps. Prepare to displace the cake by means of the annular preventer. Circulating the influx, you need to understand the YouTube models. Uh, YouTube models here uh, on the left side is a drill pipe area because in the drill pipe you have uh, you have a drill drill string area actually. In the drill pipe, you have the ID of the drill pipe, ID of the, uh, uh, the drill, the collars and the bit as well. But on the other side, you have your influx, which is connected to the analyst. So this is the YouTube that I was mentioned earlier. And uh, understanding the YouTube, you must keep the shut in bottom hole pressure constant or slightly over balance. So what you want to target when you see this YouTube is, um, we want to have as small volume as possible of the influx in our annulus. So we need to keep or maintain or try to reach where the bottom hole pressure is constant, 
constant meaning it's similar to the condition where uh, the well is not in influx condition or well is not kick condition or even better if you can, if you can go slightly over balance so that's the target and then common methods of well control there are i think there's some more than this i think i bring it here there are eight circulate and weight concurrent method and then reverse circulation dynamic kill procedure bullhead volumetric method drillers method and weight and weight method are the two main or commonly used uh, well control in the iadc right now in the iadc guide, guidelines and in the world of the drilling operation the difference between drillers method and weight and weight method is uh, the drillers method there's a, there will be two circulation so once you have the influx the first is you need to circulate the influx out with the old mud and then the second is to to pump in the kill mud without uh, without inducing additional influx into the well bore until the kill mud is fully displaced into the well bore however in the weight and weight method it's only one circulation but the calculation is a little bit different and uh, the process is a little bit uh, shorter but needs extra careful so the influx is circulated out together as you pump in the kill mud weight for me personally i like the drillers method because it's quite clear and straightforward some other prefer to have weight and weight method the i think oh no this is the number two to uh this is the second chapter before we end Drilling fluids, drilling fluids serve many functions, uh, maintain the well bore stability and well control, controlling the formation pressures, remove cuttings from the well bore, seal the permeable formations encountered while drilling by creating the mud kick, cooling and lubricating the bit, transmit the hydraulic energy to downhole, to downhole tools and the bit. It's also to be used by the directional team, uh, directional services as a means to give command to the tool phase of the, the BHA. So if you want to drill directional, you want to move to, okay, now we're, we're going to change direction to the east. And then using the mud, uh, the directional will create a pulse so that downhole, the tool phase will slightly change to the east. Then they start drilling to the east side. So that's the uh, drilling fluids functions or object objectives. Drilling fluids are often referred to as a mud or drilling mud. It was first introduced uh, around the early of 1913 for subsurface pressure control. There are several types of drilling fluid, water-based, oil-based, synthetic-based mud, compressed air, uh, air or water fluid. So I think it should be air. Okay, water-based mud, it's, uh, the first three is liquid-based. The, uh, the last two, compressed air, uh, and I think mist. The, the last one should, should tell you about mist. So the first three is liquid-based, but the other two, compressed, uh, is, uh, compressed air is a, a gas-based, but the air or water is a mist. It's a multi-phase. It's normally used in the aerated drilling operation, geothermal operation, and the underbalance operation. So water-based mud, uh, the base of the fluid is water. Oil-based mud, the base of the fluid is oil. Uh, sometimes they use diesel oil as the diesel that we have, we buy in the gas station and then synthetic base mud is uh, they create this special uh, synthetic fluid uh, commercially marketed which have specific or uh, some unique rheological performance so that at specific area 
SBM might be required. Some brand that I'm aware about synthetic base mod are SK. Yeah, got the rest. Saturn line. Okay. Move on. Air and polymer. So that's about drilling fluid. And then the last chapter will be about well completion. Well completion is defined as a steps taken to transform a drilled well into a producing wine, or you want to shut it off. Common steps taken. First is to isolate the formation by installing casing, and then perform cementation to seal the annulus from potential micro fractures or micro gas migration, and then perforation. Uh, case hole completions uh, with uh, cement behind it for sure will require perforation to create holes and connect the uh, well bore into the formation and we can start producing the hydrocarbon from there. Number four, open hole completion or barefoot, commonly known as a barefoot. The well is cased at, the, at a certain level but at the bottom level uh, at the production zen zone, they left it open and create a special barrier down there so that it avoids any potential sand problem. So that's uh, some samples of well completion. Here's a also a sample of well completion for you guys. There's a commingle single string with ESP liner completion with ESP horizontal well with ESP. So uh, these samples here, all of them are using uh, electric submersible submersible pump. But in this case, they're using the uh, ESP at what's the height? Nine joints of two and seven eight. So at this one, they're using the two and seven uh, eight tubing with the ESP, and the well is a single string. This is, sorry, this is the uh, liner completion within, within a sidetrack well. Uh, they're trying to use the same configuration, but the other one is in a horizontal well. So that's the end of completion section or chapter. Is there any question for, for this course specifically about completion or the previous chapter or any other drilling uh, question related? Feel free to ask the questions. Okay, so there is a question from Nicholas. Okay. Uh, the question is, what is the indication that severe kicks turn into a blowout? What is usually the standard procedure when it happens? Thank you, Pafikri. Okay, so if, okay, basically if, uh, if you've seen a lot of fire on the surface, that's already considered as a blowout. <laughs> but any uncontrollable situation for uh, any gas or fluid traveling to the surface, that's already falls under a blowout condition, uncontrollable. So you cannot put it, uh, a pressure to it because the pressure control system are various between one and another. You cannot put a value of flow out to it because it's impossible to measure the flow out when you are in a very dangerous condition. But basically, if it is, once you already shut in the uh, annulus, but by using the pipe ramps or the annular pre preventer, or even you, worst case scenario, you shut in your blind shear ram and shear all the drill pipe and left it in the well it's still flowing, then you are in a blowout condition. So maybe the, the, the situation is because uh, the BOP was not properly uh, inspected or maintained before they drill in the whole section. And then when you are in a B, uh, well control situation, you end up using a BOP that is uh, malfunction. That might be uh, the answer to the question. I, I believe there are two questions to that one. What's the other question, Gokira? What is usually the standard procedure when it happens? 
when a blow when a blowout happens, if kick happens, then you go to well control. You try to control the wells. Something dangerous is already entering the well board. But if a blowout happens, you run and then call out a uh, blowout specialist. They call uh, from the only thing that I know, or the only entity that I know is Boots and Boots. Uh, those are well control specialists. They they do they you leave the area, you leave the rig burning, and you start bringing another rig and start drilling from yeah start drilling from another area, and then try to pinpoint where is uh, the source of uh, this blowout or kick, and then you you gotta understand that, and then yeah you know the last depth of your drilling was at two thousand two hundred. And then when you reach 2,201 meters, you start flowing. Then you know that's the point where you want to, when, where you have the issue, right? So you know, you, you know this, you got this record and the mud logging company have this as well when they drill the first or the original well. And then you need to plan out with your, uh, where, with your delineation well or securing well. Just like what we have just like what Pertamina had in the early or uh, late December 2019. Okay, to Nicholas, are the answers satisfied? Are you quite satisfied with the answer? Yes, thank you, Bafikri, for the answer. Okay, Nicholas. Any more questions? Okay. We move on to another question. It's from Jasmine. Uh, what are the considerations for using tender assist or barge shape rigs? And what kind of mechanism or coping system that those rig types provide? Can you repeat that again? Uh, out on the last sentence. Okay, okay. The question is, what are, sorry. The question is, what are the considerations for using tender assist or barge shape rigs? And what kind of mechanism or coping system that those rig types provide? Uh... So basically the whole rig needs to have all of these systems, uh, BOP, power, and rotary, hoisting, and well control, circulating. Uh, but the difference between barge and tender assist, so tender assist, they have uh, only one deck. Tender assist is like a vessel. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a boat, but bigger than barge. And the tender assist is, uh, it has a tender assist deck. They call it bow deck or something. And uh, there's only two levels. So everything is on the vessel. The so tender assist, you got your mud pump, you got your mixing room, you got your uh, power system all in one deck. But in the jackup, you have different deck. So in the jackup, you have your engine room down at the hull. You got your uh, accommodation at the separate area. You got the helideck. You got a, a movable cantilever, and uh, that's the uh, jackup. But for barge, it's uh, less complicated. It's pretty much like uh, pretty much like this tender assist. So it's like a vessel. It's a boat basically that have the capability, but. In a, in a barge, mostly people who use barge or entity who use barge is because they, it is economic. It's small, agile, and uh, easily move from one area to another in the river. But tender assist, most of the time it's used on the uh, offshore, on the sea. So when you are in Mahakam, in the river, Mahakam blocks, Everything is using, uh, what do you call it, barge. Because at some point, when the, the water level is down, 
even the buds can lay down on the bottom of the uh, the, the, the the river level, the, the river bed. So, so at some point, the the buds stuck there because of reason is waiting on weather because they cannot move the barge. They cannot tow the barge because the water level is insufficient for the barge to float. So tender assist is better to be used in the sea, but barge, mostly because it's cheaper and smaller, is used in uh, the swamp, in the river area. I hope that answered to you. Okay. For question? Uh, okay, next question is from Julianto. The okay. question is, is there a significant difference between oil gas drilling and geothermal drilling? If there are a difference, what are the difference? Thank you. Okay, oil and gas and geothermal dif uh, drilling, the difference is um, the idea. Uh, I've never been in, in geothermal, so I'll try to answer my best. Yeah, hopefully this is correct. So in geothermal operation, the issue is not pressure. The issue is temperature. And uh, rarely you have issue with the pressure. But in the case in oil and gas is pressure. What, what you are facing the risk is the pressure. Over pressure uh, might create a... Uh, what do you call it, a blast, and uh, you're basically explosive everywhere. And you don't want that. But in uh, geothermal, temperature is the issue. So everything needs to be high temperature rated. And in geothermal operation, the target is uh, you want to chase for fracture zone. So the target is to find a low circulation area because that's the source of the heat and uh, the power that you will give to the uh, electricity company, the steam, steam source. But in oil and gas, you don't want to have low circulation. Low circulation means that it is uh, bad for the drilling operation, unable to set the completion string. And uh, also, most of the time, uh, it's not safe for retrieving the BHA. And then number three is the difference between geothermal drilling is the fluid that is used, also the surface system on the on the mud system, because in geothermal you use you drill using air drilling or aerated drilling. So in aerated drilling, uh, apart to having the mud pump, you need to have your nitrogen pump and compressors and boosters. So a lot of footprint to drill in geothermal because in geothermal, they are trying to drill uh, with high ROP and with special bit. The bit is called a uh, hammer bit. This hammer bit is operated not by using liquid, but by using air. So those are some differences that I can uh, provide to you. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, for Julianto, are, are you quite satisfied with the answer? Uh, thank you for the answer, Ms. Fikri. Okay, no problem. Okay, uh, because of the limit, limit, limitation of time, we have to move on to the next session. The next session will be the post test session. So uh, now we will give you a test as a part of evaluation of this entire course tonight. For the post test, there will be a few questions that appear in the slide and also will be read by the MC. And for the participants who know the answer, uh, you can uh, just unmute the microphone function and just answer the question right away. And don't forget, uh, this is also part of the assessment to be the best student, so please be active. Okay, so I will read the post-test question, right? Rufira, or? Uh, yeah. How is this going? Okay. All right, so 
Okay, let me stop my share screen. Okay. The first question is, can you describe the role of the mud in drilling operation? Can you describe the role of the mud, drilling mud, in the drilling operation? Anyone who wants to answer, just unmute the microphone, okay? Uh, hello? Yeah. Uh, can I answer with Bahasa? Uh, of course, go on. Oh, yeah. Don't forget to mention your name and major. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julianto. I'm from GOP6 2018. Uh, jadi, uh, pertanyaan yang dari Bapak Fikri itu tentang uh, apa uh, kegunaan dari mat di drilling ya, Pak? Kalau saya tidak kegunaan, dengar. Ya, kegunaan dan peranan lah. Boleh. Ya, kegunaan dan peranan dan mat drilling. Uh, pertama, kegunaan mat drilling itu yang setahu saya itu dia untuk menahan uh, casing. Jadi kan mat itu kan kayak semacam lumpur dia nahan casing biar dia uh, tidak roboh atau tidak jatuh itu yang pertama. Yang kedua setahu saya mat itu bisa kan mat itu kan ada fungsi dari sirkulasi sistem. Nah jadi pas yang ngebrol yang pakai drip pakai bit yang mata buah bor itu kan dari diamond itu uh, kan ada uh, formasi yang ancur-ancur gitu yang batu-batu kecil yang dari katingan itu dia yang ibarat kata tergores gitu. Nah, dari yang goresannya itu nanti dibawa mat ke, eh dibawa oleh mat di lumpur pengoboran keluar. Nah, dari yang katingan-katingan atau yang batu serpian itu nanti itu ada yang dibuang, ada yang diteliti, ada yang diteliti lagi buat nentuin uh, titik kedalaman uh, kita udah ngebrol, kita udah ngebor uh, di titik mana. Contoh misalnya. Kalau kita nemu batuan shell atau batuan sandstone, nah kita bisa tahu nih formasi atau litologi batuan yang kita lagi bor. Jadi kita bisa nentuin uh, reservoir apa saja yang uh, uh, udah sampai reservoir at atau belum. Itu sih pas saya. Makasih. Oke, okay, terima kasih jo jo Johannes ya, Julianto ya, aku lupa. Uh, Julian, Julian apa pak? Julian, Julian. Oke, okay, Julian. Iya. Uh, Oke, okay, jawabannya cukup cukup uh, integral. Jadi mungkin saya harus koreksi sedikit. Jadi fungsinya mat itu bukan untuk mengamankan casing. Jadi malah casing itu sebenarnya yang harus mengamankan mat gitu. Jadi uh, dia tidak the, the mat itself is not to secure the casing, but the mat is to prevent any pressure moving back to the upper position. It's the mud and the casing will have to sustain this pressure and contain the pressure downhole. So uh, the casing does not rely on mud. The, yes, the casing have a burst and collapse point that we need to uh, design and properly maintain during the operation. But uh, it does not sustain. It's just something that is mandatory for the operation, for the, for the uh, drilling operation. And the primary role of the mud is uh, as a barrier. The primary well control barrier in the drilling operation is the mud system. So secondary will be the BOP control system. So hopefully that complements to your initial question, uh, initial answer, Julian. Okay, so I'll move on to the next question. Uh, from all the system exists in the drilling system, Can you elaborate the function of rotary or rotating system in the drilling operation? Anyone want to answer? Uh, 
Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jonathan. Yep. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the question is uh, the use of the rotary system in the uh, rig, right? Yes, what is the function of the rotary or rotating system in the rig? Uh, well, uh, as far as I know, the main function is to drill the well itself, like uh, it's responsible for the uh, drill bit from the uh, uh, what um, uh, carrying the pipe to the down hole and then also for the trip and trip in and trip out it also uh, responsible for the um, bit breaker if I'm not mistaken and the main function is to drill the borehole okay thank you Jonathan I will give you a 30% or 40% score over there. <laughs> you. So the correct answer will be uh, the rotary system or rotating system, just try to reflect to the uh, words. So rotary system is to create force to rotation area. So it's, the function of the rotating system is just to rotate. Okay, to lift up and down is the function of the hoisting system. But together, they need to work together to drill a well. The hoisting system cannot drill a well by themselves, but the rotary system also cannot drill the well by themselves. So the hoisting system helps the string move up and down, but the rotary system or rotating system helps the string to rotate and to create easier uh, cutting lifting, not cutting lifting, cutting creation, crunching the formation. So, if you put the bit without rotational, it will not do anything to the formation. But if you uh, rotate without putting the bit into the formation, it will not uh, crunch any, anything as well. It will not gain more depth. So basically, to answer what is the uh, elaborate the function of the rotary system or rotating system in drilling, the function is to create rotational force. If there is any question later, what is the uh, function of hoisting system? The function of hoisting system is to create the force uh, to bring the string up and down, to create the vertical force. But if rotary system, it's to, towards the rotational air, uh, force. I think uh, hope, hopefully that explained to uh, Jonathan on the difference. Yes, thank you, sir. Okay, no problem. Okay, so anything, any more uh, concern about this? No, then I'll move to the last question. Okay. Can anyone explain to me what is the reason uh, or how did the kick occurs? Anyone want to answer? Just unmute or you can click the clap reaction. May I answer the question, sir? Okay. Go ahead, Ivan. Um, uh... Uh, is you asked about the indication of the well kick? Uh, um, yeah, you can put it that way. Okay. So Actually, the question is how or what is the reason? Mm. Why? Why kick occurs? Um, actually, I've been right uh, the point of the kick indication and I uh, I will try to elaborate the point in my point of view. Okay. okay. It, the, the first one is the sudden increase in drilling rate. So uh, if the drilling rate is increases, so uh, so as the well kick will, will be occur. And the second one is uh, the increase in fluid volume and the bit level. Uh, the third one is um, change in pump pressure 
and the fourth one is the deduction drill pipe wake. Uh, like you have been mentioned uh, before, that uh, in the hoisting system, the lab boards that are uh, responsible in the hoisting area, they are uh, in charge of uh, measure the weight of the drill pipe. So uh, the the uh, well kick is not it well kick. So so the well kick will be uh, can be prevented. And the last one is the gas, oil, or water cut mud. Uh, I think. Uh, that's all. Okay, thank you for the uh, answers, Ivan. Anyone else want to complement to Ivan's uh, answer? Mm. Um, may I answer this Go ahead, question? Safira. Okay, sorry about uh, how do how did the kick uh, occurs in drilling? So um, I think uh, kick is condition that uh, formation fluid migrate uh, from uh, a formation to the well bore, and uh, when the pressure is lower, low or less than formation uh, formation pressure, uh, the kick uh, started to occur. Maybe. Okay. That's all. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Savira. And uh, before it was uh, Ivan who answered, right? Yeah. Okay. So Ivan uh, is a uh, hundred percent correct on the uh, on the indication kick indication. Yes, that is correct. You got those uh, what do you call it? Indica indicators in the field where you can know that you are not in a safe condition right now. And Safira is uh, also correct. The reason or uh, why kick happens is because the formation pressure is bigger than the wellbore pressure. So okay, let me help to elaborate that a little bit while we're in this subject. Um, let me show you this. Okay, let's go with this one, this one. Okay, let's go with this one. Okay, to Safira and Ivan, all the participants. Okay, so this is a case where, uh, assume that this is your bit, and assume that there is no caving down here in the bottom hole. So when you drill, you got the analysis system here, right? Uh, where your mark presents and create hydrostatic pressure so that it prevents a fluid migration from the formation into the well bore. So when I say well bore, it is this area. Analyze in this area, this is a well bore. Or this is a well bore. Let's say it this way. Okay, with the front. So Sorry. this is a well bore. Sorry, Mr. Fikri, uh, you have not already a share screen. It, oh, it's not here. Heard? Oh, yeah. I haven't. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was still. How about now? Yeah. Apologize on that one. Sorry. Okay. So, this is a well bore. This is a drilling system, right? You got your. This is the drill string, and then this is the well bore. This is the annulus. Okay. So this this is the annulus, and uh, in the annulus. They got, you got your mud, you got your cuttings. So the flow coming from the drill pipe and then comes out to the analyst through the bit and then goes up to the uh, surface. Okay, so in this case, when drilling, uh, you have a formation pressure. Let's say the formation pressure is, it's not here. The formation pressure uh, at this point, let's say maybe 3000 PSI, okay. And then in drilling, you need to prepare mud with a weight equal to 3,100 PSI at minimum. Okay, you need to be higher than the formation pressure. That's a mandatory requirement in a basic drilling. You need to always be in overbalanced condition. 
the hydrostatic pressure in the annulus needs to be higher than the formation pressure. Okay, if your formation pressure is 3000, the mud needs to be 3100. How do you know the formation pressure is 3000 psi? You need to perform feasibility study. If there is any offset wells, you need to learn through the offset wells. You need to combine and attain all the data in the offset wells and use it as a reference for drilling in this current well. So basically, if for some reason you have a drilling operation, you prepared a 3100 PSI mud, at some point when you're drilling, you drill through a higher or overpressure which is non predicted before with a pressure of 3500 psi for example so now the formation pressure here is 3500 but here it's 3100 so the influx will migrate from higher pressure to lower pressure hope that explains to you guys Give me one minute, I'm switching on the lights. Okay, any more questions? Is that clear enough for, uh, for Evan and uh, Safira? Yeah, it's clear enough, sir. Thank you. All right, no problem. Yeah, clear, clear enough. Thank you, Mr. Fikri.